Hot Springs Village Inside Out is a closer look at the greatness of Hot Springs Village, Arkansas and the surrounding areas, people, places, experiences. Hot Springs Village is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Join me, Randy Cantrell, and my co-host Dennis Simpson as we engage in weekly conversations to explore Hot Springs Village Inside Out. Today's show is brought to you by Central Arkansas's favorite radio station, KVRE. Find them on the dial at 92.9 FM. Stream them live at kvre.com. Remax of Hot Springs Village. The award-winning Remax of Hot Springs Village is the largest real estate office inside the village with over 30 full-time agents and support staff. Visit them to learn more about this beautiful place to solve your real estate needs. Call them today at 1-800-364-9007. Find them online at explorehsv.com. They are Remax of Hot Springs Village at 1-800-364-9007 or online at explorehsv.com. Ike Eisenhower State Farm. Ike and his award-winning team have been serving the insurance needs of folks all around Hot Springs Village since 1998. Ike has qualified for State Farm's President's Club, Chairman's Circle, and Hot Springs Village Insurance Agent of the Year. Call Ike Eisenhower State Farm today at 501-984-4100. That's 501-984-4100. Find them online at IkeEisenhower.net. Call them today for all your insurance needs because, like a good neighbor, Ike Eisenhower State Farm is there. Finally here with my friend, Mr. Jeff Meeks, world-renowned bass fisherman who also does some type of newspaper thing and publishing thing and writing. Right, Jeff? Yes, I try my best. I <laughs> both. <clears throat> I saw you shudder when I did the world bass angler thing, but talk about somebody who loves to fish, Mr. Jeff. And it's it's great to have you, Jeff. Thanks for being here today, buddy. My pleasure. Good to see you again. I enjoyed seeing you at Reader's Choice. We had a good good time that night. We had a blast at Reader's Choice. For those of you that haven't, well, for those of you that aren't Bob's, Bob, best of the best. It's still if you, funny. It, it, well, if you didn't make it there, I'm sorry. And I, I, I noted very quickly, I would not have been there had I not been invited by Jennifer. So there's that. Tell us a, just a quick preview, Jeff. How long have you worked with the paper? And this is not a newspaper interview right now, but how long have you been with The Voice and, and in the village? Uh, well, we first bought property in the village in uh, August of 1982. Yeah. 82? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, there was a gal that we, we were living in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and there was a gal down the street that was walking her young daughter while my wife was walking her our young daughter. And she said, you ever heard of Hot Springs Village in, in Arkansas? And my wife said, no. And she said, and we've been married nine years, never had a vacation. And, she, and Marilyn said, well, if you go and you're willing to listen to a land deal, you can get some free nights of lodging. So we came down with no intention of buying a lot, but did in August of 82, uh, paid it off early, came down and visited many times from uh, Bolingbrook, Illinois, and northern up by Joliet, Naperville, far uh, southwestern suburb of Chicago. And then uh, we were both set to retire as teachers in uh, 2005. So we started taking the voice newspaper in 2003 and keeping an eye on the real estate market. We came down each vacation time we had uh, to look at housing and uh, settled on a house on uh, Lake Balboa on Leventino Drive uh, and uh, moved in in June of 2005. And uh, I, to a point you made, I moved here to try to catch every bass in Lake Balboa at least once. At once. least once. At, at least, least once. once. And, I, you know, I had no journalistic experience. I had nothing on my radar to do in terms of employment. I had started doing military veterans oral histories a couple of years before we moved back in Illinois. And I thought, well, I might do some of that. And in fact, the first guy I interviewed was, uh, um, his name was Mr. Mueller. He was in the 11th Panzer Division in the German Army. He moved really? Here. He moved here because he said Hot Springs Village reminded him of the Black Forest. 
Wow. Yeah. And so my wife still is really big into DAR. And she came home from a meeting once and said that the Akansa chapter of DAR wanted to connect with something called the Veterans History Project. Jeff, had you ever heard of it? And I said, no. Well, it's, uh, you, believe it or not, unanimously passed by Congress to create the Veterans History Project to record and preserve veteran oral histories at the Library of Congress. And so I started doing those right at the tail end of 2006. And uh, I woke up one morning and uh, I thought, you know, I wonder, because I, I record the, their story and I give it to them. I would send a copy to Washington and I would keep a copy. I have all 400 of them here in the house. Wow. And uh, I woke up one morning and I thought, you know, I wonder if the newspaper would be interested in this because it's just a guy next door. Yeah. And I'm meeting people that I'd read about for a long time. You probably can't see the rest of my library here, but it's full. And it used to be a lot more. Oh, Lord. Two World War II books and so on. So I'm meeting people that lived through and experienced what I've been reading about for a decade. So I called the voice office. And at that time, Frank Leeming was the uh, running the show. And I told him what I was doing. He said, well, uh, let me think about it. And uh, he, he called me back. And uh, he said, OK, he said, uh, once a month, you have a 750 word limit, but we're not paying you. Well, I, you know, I do it wasn't doing it for pay anyway. So, OK. So my first uh, veterans column back then was called They Answered the Call, mm -hmm. showed up in January of 07. And then later that fall, I noticed in the voice that uh, they needed a proofreader. So I called Frank and I said, hey, tell me more about this proofreader job. And he said, come have lunch with me. I said, OK. So we met, at, if I remember right, it was at the 19th hole, which mm -hmm. isn't there anymore. And I found out he wanted me. He didn't. I said, I don't want you as a staff. Or I don't want you as a proofreader. I want you as a staff writer. And I I said, no, thanks. I don't. The, the, well, and the, the last time you had ever been a staff writer was when? Never. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I want to make note, just introduce two things here real quick. Number one, DAR is Daughters of the Rep of the Revolution. Daughters right? of the American Revolution. Mar Daughters of the American Revolution. And the other thing is, real quick, you know, it, it really is the place where you come to reinvent yourself. I, I see so many people over and over and over. I, I, I'm, and, you know, we know each other a little, but I thought you had journalistic pre, uh, 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 previous experience. I didn't know that. So we're at the 19th Club. We're talking to Frank Fleming, who is a dearly missed member of our community. Love that guy. What a dynamic influence he was for the village. But you're at the 19th hole, and you just said, no, I don't think so. No, I, I said, I remember what exactly what I said to him, you know, I, he, he said, you know, you're a good writer and I think you'll enjoy it. And you tell a good story. And I said, no, I, Frank, I, I don't think so. And I said, uh, you know, I don't know how you make a POA meeting as interesting as a B-24 pilot bombing Germany. And I remember he laughed and, and we talked a little more and I turned him down again. And um, it was like the middle of the week. I remember. And he said, well, you think about it and give me a call by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. And so I talked about it with my wife, Jean, and I thought, you know, eh, what the heck? You like to write. So uh, I called him and I said, um, I'll go with your gut feeling rather than my own. And I'll say yes with under one condition. That if I don't like it, I can quit and you won't cancel my they answered the call column. And he said yes, and he gave me a real short beat list of trails committee meetings and uh, Washington National Forest and the Lakes Committee. And uh, just over time, I went from a part-time staff writer to staff writer to senior reporter to managing editor. So I'm going to tell a little story <laughs> between uh, – who knew? Who knew? I'm going to tell a little story between me and you. Uh, I, I joked with you at the, the voice boards about this that uh, the last time I had seen you – was you were walking out of a computer club meeting where I was the vice president at that time. And, and we were discussing internet options coming up. And I said, well, you know, are you not going to stay? And you said, no, no, I'm moving. I'm done. I'm gone. And I said, well, that will keep the village voice from hiring you for a fourth time. But apparently it didn't keep them from hiring you for a fourth time. How many retirement parties does a guy need to have? Uh, Jeff, well, I'm curious. You know, somebody told me I'm allergic to retirement. <laughs> 
I hear I hear the hours are good, but the pays kind of sucks. That's what I hear. Well, um, you don't get rich doing it, but you know, none of us there. Uh, we all do it because we love the community, and uh, we want to be helpful to the community. And uh, uh, Dennis, uh, it's just a it was just a wonderful experience living there and and meeting you know so many veterans. I got so ingrained in the veteran community. I remember one fella, <clears throat> Jerry Devon, he since passed away. He was the first medic to cross the bridge at Remagen over the Rhine into Germany. To give wow. you a sense of how close some of us would get, um, he called me once and asked me if I could come over and fix his air conditioner. And I said, well, you know, uh, love you, Jerry, but I'm not an HVAC guy. I just, I can try to uh, give you some suggestions on who to call, but that's, that's not me. And, you know, I've, I've spoken at some of their funerals. Um, it, it's just and beyond the veterans, you know, I, just the people I've been able to to meet and interview, like Bonnie and Clyde's relatives. Really? Yeah, a fella in the village who helped uh, Apollo fourteen limp back to Earth, and just wow. on and on and on and on it goes. It's just uh, you know, for a history nut like me. And curious to begin with, um, the village was paradise for me. It was uh, it was difficult to leave. I bet, I bet. Well, and and to just catch up real quick, you still work for the Village Voice, and and in what capacity now? I'm uh, the assignment editor and correspondent, and so uh, all the staff writers send their their stuff into me, and, and I check it in and keep track of what's gotten in and what's yet to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, I still write. Uh, quite a bit about the public services department, the mm -hmm. lakes committee, uh, Kelly Hale and I interview once a month. Uh, we started a column with the public services director, Ken Unger, that we, uh, we call ask Ken, which I think has been very helpful. Extraordinarily helpful. Yeah. And so you'll, you'll see another one of those in uh, Tuesday's paper. And so, um, I, I guess I, when I let, I guess I just didn't realize the depth of the connection I made with people couldn't because couldn't let go of it. Now, now you're you're not you're in Texas now, but I mean that doesn't mean you're not here on a regular basis. You come back on a regular basis, but I, I can't and I haven't haven't learned enough about you to know how did we get to the JFK books? Now you had one come out on Amazon uh, August the tenth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is your amazing. third book about JFK. You see, I would have yeah. thought you would have explored all that in the first two books, but no, there's more, right? Well. um, if I, when I started with the voice, you know, I think everybody thought I was a World War II historian. Cause that's all, you know, that was my signature thing. That, that right. well, well, I mean, that, that's what, what they knew you as when you walked yeah, in the door, exactly. that was, that was your gig. That's exactly right. But what they didn't know is I'd spent 25 years looking into the Kennedy assassination and it all started for me in, on March 6th, 1975, you may remember the old late night television program by Geraldo Rivera called mm -hmm. Night America. Mm -hmm. Well, I was unemployed at that time. And uh, I wanted to stay up and watch the program. I had no idea the Kennedy assassination was going to be discussed. And the reason I stayed up to watch was because Raquel Welsh was going to be on the program. And who wouldn't stay up for that, right? Well, you know, it was a no brainer for me. She had just won a Golden Globe. And so, you know. I didn't have anything else to do in the morning. So I thought, well, I'll stay up and watch. And they had uh, Robert Groden on the program, mm -hmm. along with Dick Gregory. And Robert Groden had the courage to show to the a national audience for the first time the Abraham Zapruder film of the, of the murder. And by the way, Robert Groden uh, wrote, has written the foreword for my latest book. Oh, wow. How great. And, yeah. And so, you know, I... I saw the Zapruder film and I, you know, when you see Kennedy's head go like this, you're like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so Rivera said in three weeks, our next program, we're going to devote the whole 90 minutes to the Kennedy assassination. So I borrowed my mother's little tape recorder and I sat in front of the television and recorded it and watched it. And they had several authors on and they were talking about, you know, A, B, C, and D and referring to books and still skeptical I went to the library and I checked out those books and I read them. 
copies of which are now on the shelf behind me. But I was still skeptical. And I, you know, I checked the footnotes in the back of the book. And being skeptical, I wrote to Washington for the documents that they were referring to. Yeah. Yeah. And by golly, what they were saying was true. And so, that, that was the beginning of it. And nine months later, I'm in Dallas interviewing police officers and suspects. And yeah, it just uh, took off. And from about 75 to 95, I was really connected, really doing a lot of active research. And then uh, when I started interviewing and talking with mafia lawyers, my wife kind of didn't really appreciate that. <laughs> Did she not? Did she, she did not? not? You didn't bring them to the house, right? You left them. No, yeah. No. Yeah, uh, no. And uh, and so I would say from like 95, 96 to about 2015, I was not actively researching. But a book had come out. If it looked good, uh, I'd buy it. But in terms of me seeking out information, uh, you know, that was kind of a downtime for me. And then when those documents started coming out uh, in 2017, I guess it was, um, I got reinvigorated, I guess I could say. Well, I, I find this I, interesting. I've been on it ever since. I find it interesting because obviously you had a reporter investigator mindset before you ever set foot in the village, or I say before you moved to the village, I should say, be more specific. Uh -huh. You just didn't know that it would turn into that or plow into that and fascinating. So yeah. I, I've got, without giving away any of the books or any of the material that you have here, tell me about this magic bullet theory. Tell me, tell me what, what do you think about that? Okay. The magic bullet theory in, in a sentence, what I think of it, I think it is, it's garbage. Well, let, let, let's do the five mile high view. What is what is the magic bullet? The theory? magic bullet theory is about a bullet that was allegedly found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. Mm -hmm. It was deemed Commission Exhibit three ninety nine. Mm -hmm. There is a bit of the cone, the top part of the bullet that is missing, and the base of it is a bit squeezed. And the Warren Commission, uh, thanks to the work of uh, future uh, President Nixon. Senator. Mm -hmm. uh, Arlen Specter mm -hmm. uh, floated the theory and they, they bought into it that um, that bullet had hit Kennedy, exited Kennedy through his throat, hit Governor Connolly in the back, came out his chest, went into and out of his wrist and embedded in his left thigh. And at Parkland Hospital, that bullet came out of Connolly's body on his stretcher. <clears throat> now, the reason that was, the reason that had to be was because of the rifle that Oswald was using and the time frame in which it appeared that shots were fired, you couldn't get off more than three shots by a single shooter. And, and you when one bullet, one, one so bullet's going to go through four different pieces of people, seven, seat, one, seven. one, two, Connolly, three, four, five, six, seven. Wounds. Into his leg. One bullet. And um, Amazing bullet, huh? Well, that's why they call it the magic bullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the single bullet theory. And I wrote about this uh, about a year ago uh, when I, sometimes this stuff just finds me. Uh, I realized that there was the daughter of an FBI lab agent that lived near where I now live in Texas. Really? Yes. And she let me look at her father's raw lab notes. Oh, you are kidding. Raw lab notes. Yeah, handwritten notes, charts, etc. Uh-huh. And um I won't go into detail because it would take too long, but um basically he did not find any copper in the in the uh, throat wound of Kennedy. And the Oswald bullets were uh copper jacketed. So there's copper on Kennedy's back. There's copper on all of Connolly's wounds, but there's no copper here. So how could it be the same bullet? It couldn't be. And so, so uh, that, the, that, uh, uh -huh. that interview that interview is in uh, the JFK files, pieces of the assassination puzzle. Now I want to let me zoom in here just for a second. That's the newest book that you have here on the the blue background here, right? Is that correct that we're showing? That's correct. So do you? Do you think you can come to a conclusion or do you just have a lot of the pieces? I mean, how do you do that? Well, you know, it's as a private citizen, um, 
you're limited by what the government releases. Well, that's true. Um, so can we come to a conclusion? I think we have come to some conclusions. Uh, one being that the single bullet theory is a joke. And what I learned over time, and I wrote about this, and this is also in the JFK files, uh, Dennis, the Warren commissioners didn't believe the single bullet theory either. Really? No, they didn't. They didn't speak up. Warren, Earl Warren ran the commission, thus the Warren commission, and he didn't, he did not want any dissenting views. And so, uh, you know, they, they put the report out and it wasn't long thereafter that um, you find out that several of the uh, uh, commissioners didn't believe it possible for that bullet to cause all seven wounds. And I, Warren even had his doubts. There were seven people on the Warren Commission, and six of them uh, voiced, after the fact, uh, a hesitancy to believe the single bullet theory, which has to be the case if you have a single shooter with three bullets shot. Within the a five-second period or whatever. Right. Exactly. Thank you. The only, one, only Warren Commissioner that never voiced any uh, questions was Alan Dulles. Who was Alan Dulles? He was the former head of the CIA, uh, kicked out of office uh, by John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I would I would argue that the reason he didn't have any questions is he knew the answers. And I bet he had to have sat on pins and needles at those meetings, hoping that the Castro assassination plots and all the other CIA dirty tricks were not going to be uncovered. Just hoping the particular things didn't come to light, if you get my yes. point, right? Yeah, and you know, I've got file drawers over here on my left uh, full of documents. I could show you one where the CIA just comes right out and says in a document that has been released in the last few years that, you know, uh, don't mention this. We'll just wait them out. Uh, you know, you talk about the Warren Commission. One of the things that go through my mind, it was a who's who. Was was Gerald Ford on that? He was. Uh, I'm thinking there were it was a who's who of, of who went on to become things. Mm -hmm. And interesting parallel there too but i will yeah. make note that um uh, i think for me uh, when did the warren commission finish was it 65 60 no uh they issued their report um i think the middle of september of 64 yeah and, and the reason why i'm getting at that is because the nation was hurting that that's no exaggeration by any stretch and I think Warren just wanted to put a rubber stamp on it, put it in the drawer and go, see, we've covered this. Mm -hmm. And when the Zucruder film came out, which I was watching Geraldo Rivera that same time, I really? remember seeing the Zucruder film. And I remembered when they slowed it down for, for some particular frames, I thought, dear Lord above, how do you explain that? Yeah. Well, if, if you or any of your listeners have an opportunity to uh, go online and find Zapruder frame 230. 230. 230. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that two of those seven wounds went in, one, one of those seven went in Connolly's wrist, and one of the other seven came out his wrist. And mm -hmm. if you look at frame 230, you will see that it is obvious that Kennedy has already been struck by a bullet. Mm -hmm. Remember, the Warren Commission concluded that that same bullet hit Connolly and went through his wrist. Yet clearly, in frame 230, you see Connolly's wrist and hand hanging onto his Stetson. That wrist hasn't been hit by anything. So, and, and we're talking, was, and I'm guessing here, because I didn't look at it, is this 24 frame? 24 frame a second? Do you know? Is it what? I'm sorry? Is it 24 frame? frames per uh, second? I think it was. I think it was 18 frames per second. But 18 I'm not frames positive. per second. I think but, so, yes. But you're still saying <clears throat> in frame 230, you can see him holding his Stetson in his hand, which it would take his wrist to do. And in the back seat, you can see Kennedy obviously, yeah, already impaled from a serious wound. Fascinating, yes. fascinating, fascinating. So do you think it's still just a cover up? Is this just a, 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 a secret we're going to know in another 20 years or what? Um, I believe at the very least, the CIA and the FBI are covering up uh, for this reason. They blew it. There were other attempts uh, in the making on Kennedy's life. Really? Uh, that, uh, you know, some people don't believe it. Most of us do. There was a, an attempt in early November. That There were plans for an attempt early in November in Chicago, one uh, just a week before 
November 22nd in uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, and when all the information first started coming out, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you get the impression that the CIA had never heard of Lee Harvey Oswald and he was just this lone idiot, you know, was in the Marine and he was a defector, you know, he went to Russia. But when you research it, you find out that Lee Harvey Oswald was all over the CIA's and the FBI's radar going back to 1959. Really? And back in, in and out of Cuba a dozen times also, right? Well, um, I not that I know of. Okay. Possibly. Um, also in the book, the JFK Files, I have two appendix because I never wrote an article about it, but I wanted to get it in the book because it's it, to me it's extremely important. Many years ago, 76, 77, I did I don't remember how I found him. <clears throat> but I found a man by the name of Ron Crawley, who was in Oswald's unit, uh, Marine Air Control Squadron unit at, at Sugi, Japan. And Oswald's job when he was in the Marine Corps was he was a radar operator. He plotted the course and knew all the codes and et cetera, et cetera, for the U-2 spy plane. Mm. And so Crawley served with him. Well, well let, me, let me interrupt just a sec. His security clearance would have to be significant. Is that right? Was, as far as we know, it was at least secret. Okay. Maybe not unclassified or classified, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And I'm sorry. So, no, that's okay. And um, hang on a second. Is that Okay. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, we're talking about this Ron Crawley, which I interviewed in 1976 and 1977. And it's in the appendix of this book. But to me, um, well, this is what I wrote. Uh, as far as I know, in all the assassination research that has been done, this is the only interview done with Crawley about his Marine Corps service with Lee Harvey Oswald at Atsugi, Japan. Crawley is briefly mentioned in the book Harvey and Lee by John Armstrong, but there's no writing about what Crawley knew about Oswald. Here are my notes from an amazing interview, which I believe speaks to when the CIA recruited Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, it is my opinion that what Ron Crawley talks about here is evidence of when Lee Harvey Oswald was recruited or pitched, as they say, by the CIA. November 7th. 1976, I asked if there was anything unusual about Oswald. Crawley said, quote, I can't give you that information, end quote, and that he had to sign an affidavit while serving there. I asked if Oswald disappeared at times. Quote, I'd say yes, end quote, quote Crawley said, and estimated the length of time at two to three weeks, and to me, Dennis, this is interesting, at a time, meaning more than once. So he was actively on, on duty and he would just go away for two or three weeks at a time? That's correct. So you would be AWOL unless you had leave. But if you had leave, you just came and went, right? Yep. Hmm. Other, other comments by Crawley. Oswald was pretty closed mouth. Crawley talked about the incident with the Derringer. Uh, Oswald was accidentally shot himself with a Derringer. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let me find something. That's, let's see here. I asked if uh, Crawley saw these U-2 flights that came in and out of Atsugi. And he said, yes, I handled it myself. Uh, we only saw the U-2 when it took off and landed. We were right across the runway. Oswald was just an everyday individual, didn't stand out much, which to me seemed a bit strange, seeing as, as he's speaking Russian in the, in, the, in the Marines. And Crawley sounded irritated when he answered the phone during my second interview in May of 77. And he said, he's had a lot of people call him this year and he doesn't know who they are. And I asked if he'd answer a few more questions. And he said, I don't know. I don't think I should answer anything anymore. I don't know who these people are. Crawley said he had training in Jacksonville and Biloxi, but not when Oswald was there. I asked, were you ever talked to about other assignments? Quote, I can't answer that one, end quote. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. As a radar operator, he also had secret clearance. Oswald said Crawley wanted people to think he was an eight ball, but he wasn't. Quote, he was well read. He was no fool, end quote. I asked, was Oswald with an intelligence agency when he went to Russia? 
Crawley said, quote, it's a possibility, yes, there was CIA all over the place, meaning at Tsugi Naval Air Station. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I think that's when uh, Oswald, when the CIA made contact with Oswald, uh, they, they knew there, there were a rash of defectors going to the Soviet Union at that time. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a, a bar called the Queen Bee near Atsugi Naval Air Station where the guys would go. And it was, it was full of spies and informants. In fact, one guy um, I read about said that uh, he was there one night and one of these ladies said to him, so I hear your unit's going over to uh, the Philippines. And he would say, not that I know. And he'd get back to the base and a week later, we're going to the Philippines. And so there was that kind of loose talk over there. Well, I, I, I would argue that certain people knew that Oswald was speaking Russian, bad mouth in the U.S. And so he made a perfect false defector to go to Russia. And they contacted him about that and said, you know what? You don't have to spy. A lot of people say, well, yeah, come on. Lee Harvey Oswald, is, this is the type of person who would be a spy. Well, I don't think he was. I think he was told, all you have to do, Lee, is tell the truth. Go over there and tell him that you're a former Marine Corps uh, radar operator who handles the U-2 spy planes. And that will be... Uh, Enough. That will be a... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the KGB, who's got the American embassy bug. So you go over there and you tell them that, and you tell them that you're, you're willing to give up military secrets. And then CIA would want to see what the KGB's response was to this. Well, um, six months later, coincidentally, Francis Gary Powers is shut down over the Soviet Union. In what we thought was an unbelievable move, we thought it would be so high, 100,000 feet, edge of space, nobody would ever, ever, ever shoot. What? You, yeah. So what? So yeah. then, well, I'm sorry, who was it? Truman? Truman that denied that it even happened? Eisenhower. Eisenhower, I'm sorry. Eisenhower uh, first called it a, uh, a weather reconnaissance plane, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. And Khrushchev just kind of gave Eisenhower enough rope to hang himself, and then he showed pictures of it of U-2 wreckage, which I found out many, many, many years later wasn't really the wreckage of the U-2. But really? But he said it was, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But, Jeff, uh, I, so, I, I, I tell you what, we could do this all day, and I tell you what we're going to do. Good. We're going to come back and do this. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Man, I'd love to come back and finish up more of this. I, I know time's about to catch us. I've got to run, and I know you do too. Uh, what would you say to the average person that looks at the book and goes, eh, pieces of the assassination what 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 would i get out of this what's in it for me well you're going to hear uh you're going to read interviews with i'll use an example ruth payne Mm -hmm. who is the lady that has housed oswald's family at the time of the assassination that's where uh lee's wife and child were staying in irving while lee stayed at 1026 north beckley near the Texas School Book Depository. Mm-hmm. And for decades, Ruth has been accused of being Oswald's CIA handler. Okay. And with some prompting from Bill Simpich, who, along with Larry Schnaff, are the two lawyers that are suing the Biden administration currently to get release of records, he told me, I'm serious, this is what he said, because I had interviewed Ruth a few times in, in person. Yeah. He said that Ruth trusts you more than anybody on the planet. You need to ask her about, you know, A, B, C, and D. And I said, really? Okay, I will. So send me your questions. I'll put them with mine. And so I called Ruth and I said, what do you think about doing an interview about all the uh, allegations that your CIA connected? And I remember she said, well, what would be the point of that? And I said, well, the point of that would be that you could answer the critics and you could get your two cents out there. Refute or refute or approve. Yes. And so we did at length interviews about Ruth Payne. Are there CIA connections there? That's in the book. Uh, I also interviewed a lady by the name of Sue Vogelsinger, who was in the Kennedy administration. 
She was on Air Force One sitting at the, uh, Love Field during the motorcade. She did not go on the motorcade. But word gets back to the plane that Kennedy's dead. So she and her assistant get off the plane. They go on to what? I guess you might call it Air Force Two. You're right. Right. Yeah, another plane. And she talks about in some detail about the atmosphere on that plane, that there were Texas legislators there that were not upset that Kennedy had been just been killed. Unbelievable. Jeff. And, to the, and to the point that the Secret Service agents moved them to a different part of the plane so they wouldn't have to hear it. Um, there's also... Uh, an article in there about how did Jack Ruby really get into the basement to kill Oswald? Yeah. I wondered. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a whole have, bunch of, I also have a story in there about the call of the guns of Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. um, he mail ordered for a pistol. He mail ordered for a rifle. And what I learned um, through uh, some hearings from another committee uh, was that there were three ways to legally order guns in Texas in 1963. Oswald followed none of them. So how did he get his guns? And ask yourself this. These guns are mail order. So you you have to go to the post office and pick them up, right? Sure. Yeah, now he had a post office. Yeah, yeah, and he had a post office box, but you can't fit a rifle in there. Mm -hmm. And so the assassination occurs, and Oswald's picture is plastered all over the globe. Right. Did anyone ever come forward from the post office and say, I remember that guy. I remember him coming in, coming, picking up a couple packages. No. Silence. Silence. And he never, and he never followed any of the three rules. The rules are in the book. Uh, there's a lot of deep, a lot more detail on that in the book. Uh, I also talk about the era of the Kennedy administration and how he's seeking uh, peace with behind the scenes with Khrushchev and, and Castro and trying to get out of Cuba and his military just, you know, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, they wanted to just blow off the planet. Yep. Cuba. And had we done so, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but the Russian commanders there had permission to use nuclear weapons to repel us. Yeah. That would have been to some degree, the end of the world. Yeah, and exactly. And, and not knowing we came that close and all this is interrelated. Jeff, I, I'm, I'm sorry, time has got me. Okay. We're coming back. Will you come back with me? You betcha. Jeff, thanks so much. Dennis Simpson, Hot Springs Village Inside Out, Mr. Jeff Meeks from The Village Voice and an independent author. And we will see you next time. Thanks for watching and listening to Hot Springs Village Inside Out, a weekly podcast starring Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. Visit the website at hotspringsvillageinsideout.com.